get started um, because we have a lot of ground to cover tonight. Um, so thank you everyone for attending. Um, Raven and I are very thrilled at the interest in this program. Uh, my name is Lauren Menges and I am the head of the North Carolina collection at Maine Library. Um, the North Carolina collection is the local history and research department of the library. Um, and I'll talk more about that later. Um, I did just want to give sort of a disclaimer at the beginning of the presentation that I am not a historian myself. Um, I am not an expert in Durham history by any means. Um, this is a, meant to be a very broad introductory type of presentation. Um, I'm sure I'll miss some things that you might be wondering about. I may not be able to answer all your questions, but I'll do the best that I can. Um, I'm gonna cover a lot of ground, a lot of different topics, and any one of these topics would make for it is rich enough and there's a lot enough to, um, there's enough to say that they could make their own presentations on their own. So um, just wanted to kind of set some expectations for, for the presentation tonight. Um, it's, we're gonna roughly go in chronological order, but I've also organized things by topic. Um, so let me see if I can, yeah, still can't share video, but that's okay. Um, can see my screen, I assume. Yes, we can see your okay. screen, Lauren. So sorry, still working That's on okay. that. That's all right. Um, okay, so let's just go ahead and get started. Um, so we're gonna go back in time, way, way, way back in time to the 16th and 17th centuries. Um, so the original people living in this area were the um, indigenous tribes of the Eno and the Okanichi. Um, so these tribes helped to mold the area by establishing settlements and commercial transportation routes. Um, the Great Trading Path, which spanned from Virginia to Georgia, was traced through Durham. So um, one of the earliest European explorers to, to visit this area was John Letterer, a German doctor. Um, so he was the first European to describe the land that is now Durham County in 1670. And this is a, this image is a map of some of his travels. So in 1701, um, the English explorer John Lawson traveled much of North and South Carolina. Um, in the area that would become Durham County, he spent time in an Eno village and was guided by a local tribe member that went by the name of Eno Will. And Lawson described this area as the flower of the Carolinas. So he was very taken with this area. So Durham County is one of the younger counties in the state of North Carolina and was not founded until 1881. Prior to that, it and several other North Carolina counties were part of Orange County, which was founded in 1752. So that is one of the older counties in the state. Hillsboro has been the county seat of Orange County since 1766 and was the location of the local court and government officials. Okay, let me see, try one more time with the video. There we go, there I am. Hello everyone. <laughs> um, so the image um, that I'm displaying here is an outline of the old Orange County and you can see the actual breakdown of the, ca the counties that formed out of Orange County. So it covered quite a large area compared to what we're familiar with today. Okay, so beginning in the 1720s and peaking in the early 1770s, waves of Scottish, Irish and English emigrants began settling in North Carolina. King Charles I provided the first land grants that these colonists settled on. So these early European settlers worked the land or built grist or sawmills. Um, and many families today still trace their roots back to these um, cultures and they, and they celebrate um, these traditions. The image that you're looking at here is from 19, roughly 1916. Um, and it's an image of some Scottish dancers. So there are still, gatherings, annual gatherings, um, and celebrations of these cultures throughout the state. So um, grist and sawmills were essential to the 18th century agricultural economy in this area. 
By the mid 1800s, there were at least 32 different mills in operation on the Eno River alone. Um, so that image in the upper right corner, um, all those little dots indicate locations of mills. Um, and that's actually as of 1860. So that's a little bit later, but that's one of the earlier maps that we, can, that we have that documents the location of mills. So mills provided farming families with cornmeal to make bread and lumber to build their homes and also allowed them to participate in the local market economy. So prior to the American Revolution, North Carolina colonists became upset by what they perceived to be abuses by government officials, including excessive taxes, dishonest sheriffs, and illegal fees. Um, so in 1768, clashes between the colonists and the government sprang up across the state and in this area, and what was called the War of the Regulation began. Um, so you may have heard of the term the regulators before, that is actually where that comes from. So the governor at the time was Governor Tryon, and he sought to crush this rebellion. And after an, an initial skirmish in Hillsborough that he lost, the regulators were soundly defeated by the, the British militia at the Battle of Alamance in 1771. So although the regulators themselves were not successful, their efforts were certainly a precursor to the coming Revolutionary War. So the American Revolution, um, no major battles were fought in this area, but the inhabitants of Orange County were still affected by the war, shortages of things like money, food, and of course the men that went off to fight in the war caused hardship for everyone. Um, and because Hillsboro was a, a, a seat of local government, um, it was also an important area, even though no battles were fought here. So the North Carolina Provincial Congress met in Hillsborough in 1775, and then the North Carolina General Assembly met here in 1778, 82, and 83. So Hillsborough, again, was a military and political center of the state, so the people in this area were very much impacted by the war. So slavery um, was definitely an integral part of the Orange County economy by the late 1700s. Um, one of the largest plantations in the state of North Carolina was in this area, and it was owned by the Benahan Cameron family. Um, and that plantation was called Stagville. So the plantation was approximately 30,000 acres, and it enslaved about 900 people. So it was quite large. Um, historic Stagville is now a state historic site um, that you can visit. Um, it protects a small part of the original plantation in Durham County, and it, it includes the original quarters of enslaved people. Um, in the upper right picture, you'll see um, one of those cabins that's dated to approximately 1851. Um, there's a large barn dated to 1860 on the property. And then in the lower right corner um, is the Benahan family house, which dates back to the late 1700s. So um, before the city of Durham came to be what we know it today, um, it briefly was called Dilliardsville. Um, so William Dilliard was a Wake County landowner. He um, bought land in Orange County, what is now Durham County in 1819 concentrated around what we now know as Dillard Street in downtown today. And this community was called Dillardsville. So the current Dillard Street that we know um, that runs downtown, is, it runs through the heart of this area um, and it is likely a corruption of the original name Dillard. Um, so this image from Google Maps shows roughly the current locations um, of that area. So um, much of the Dilliard land was eventually bought by a man named William Pratt. So when the North Carolina Railroad officials were planning um, train routes throughout the state, they approached him about selling his land for a rail station. Um, but Mr. Pratt was a little greedy and he demanded an exorbitant price. So instead of working with him, the railroad went to his neighbor, Dr. Bartlett Durham instead. Um, and if you can kind of picture the railroad tracks downtown, you, you know how they, they sort of make a curve around East Durham. Um, that 
is thanks to Mr. Pratt. Um, that route was designed to avoid his property because he uh, was demanding too much money to let the, the railroad company build there. Um, so had he been a more willing partner, Durham might well have been called Prattsburg instead. So our namesake, Dr. Bartlett Leonidas Snipes Durham was born in 1824 and raised about 12 miles west of Chapel Hill in rural Orange County. He attended medical school at the University of Pennsylvania and then returned to Orange County to practice medicine around 1848. Um, at that time, he bought 100 acres of land in the eastern portion of the county. In 1849, he donated four acres of land to the railroad, which in turn named the stop Durham Station after him and the collection of houses and stores that sprang up around the station were known as Durhamsville, and then that was eventually shortened to Durham. And a post office was established there on April 26, 1853, which is the city's original birthday. So in the early 1850s, Durham was actually elected to represent Orange County in the, in, in the North Carolina General Assembly. Um, unfortunately, he died um, in February 1859 from pneumonia, um, and he actually was originally buried in an unmarked grave in Antioch Cemetery in Orange County. Um, but years later, after Durham County was established and the name Durham County was official, um, a man named Julian Shakespeare Carr began a campaign to exhume and rebury Durham's remains within his namesake city. Um, he actually wasn't successful while he was alive, though. Um, that effort didn't actually take place until nearly a decade after Carr himself died. Um, so it wasn't until 1933 uh, that Durham officials exhumed um, Bartlett Durham's remains and reinterred him in Maplewood Cemetery the following year. So this image is a picture of the um, headstone that is in Maplewood Cemetery. It's interesting because um, they left off part of his name and the birth and death dates are incorrect. So um, maybe someday someone will lead another effort to <laughs> change, change the, the headstone for him. Okay, so as we all know, tobacco um, is a major part of Durham's history. Um, it's always been a major crop for the state of North Carolina, but it wasn't until 1839 and a lucky mistake that led to the accidental development of the brightleaf variety um, for which this area was well known. So that um, variety would lead to an eventual boom in the local tobacco market. So what happened was um, an enslaved person on a tobacco farm in Caswell County was in charge of overseeing the tobacco curing process. And one day he accidentally fell asleep during this um, process and the curing fire went almost completely out. So he woke up suddenly and realized the fire was almost out. So to quickly restart it, he used charcoal from the nearby blacksmithing pit. And this resulted in a sudden intense heat that cured the tobacco quickly and turned the leaves gold. Um, this resulting tobacco was lighter and more aromatic, um, came to be known as bright leaf because of the brightly golden color, and a new regional variety was soon established. So with the railroad came the tobacco industry, uh, which needed access to transportation to thrive. Um, so in 1858, a Virginian named Wesley Wright established the first tobacco processing factory in Durham with a man named Thomas Morris. So this is um, a, a drawing, a rendering of an early tobacco factory. And right before the Civil War is about the time that the local industry really got going. So um, the Civil War itself, similar to the American Revolution, no major battles were fought in this area. Um, but Durham played an important role in the ending of the Civil War. Uh, so to give, to give you some context, sort of paint a picture for you, um, it's 1865, Major General William T. Sherman's Union Army occupied Raleigh, 
at that time, um, the last major Confederate army commanded by General Joseph E. Johnston was headquartered in Greensboro, about 50 miles away. Um, so in 1865, after General Robert E. Lee surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia, Confederate President Jefferson Davis was unconvinced of the Confederacy's defeat. He didn't wanna give up. So he urged General Joseph Johnston um, who was stationed in Hillsboro to continue to wage guerrilla warfare. Johnston, however, knew that this would be futile and would only lead to more death. So he opened communication with General Sherman who agreed to meet with him. So on the morning that Sherman learned of Abraham Lincoln's assassination, he took the train from Raleigh to Durham station to meet Johnston. So, Durham happened to be right between Raleigh and Greensboro, where the two um, armies were located. They met at the Bennett Farmstead, where terms of surrender were negotiated. And this surrender was actually the largest of the entire war, with over 90,000 Confederate troops being surrendered. And these images here um, is an etching of the Bennett House, Bennett Place, um, and then a, an illustration of the two generals meeting in that house discussing uh, peace negotiations. So while peace was being negotiated between these two armies, thousands of soldiers from both sides of the war were camped out around the neutral Durham countryside. So while there, they were sort of bored, um, they were spending a lot of time just kind of sitting around and smoking tobacco. And it was here that they had their first experience with the local Brightleaf tobacco um, from a local producer, J.R. Green, and he had a warehouse near Durham Station. Um, the troops were so hungry for this tobacco that they plundered the warehouse of its entire contents and Green thought himself a ruined man. Um, however, it turned out okay for him because when the thousands of soldiers returned to their homes across the country after the war was really over, they wrote back to Durham Station asking for more tobacco um, because they liked this variety so much. Um, so Green's business and other Durham tobacco businesses really started to boom and they were off and running. So with all these tobacco orders pouring in, Green realized he needed a specific name and trademark for his product. Um, so over a lunch rumored to be of oysters with his friend named James Witted of Hillsboro, Witted pointed to the bull's head on the Coleman's Durham brand mustard jar that was on the table and suggested that Green also use a bull for his trademark. So thus, bull Durham tobacco was born. Um, so it's in a way, a coincidence that this jar of mustard happened to be on their table. It was made in Durham, England. The connection was obvious. So um, that is really where the bull uh, comes from and, and why we are now called Bull City. Okay, so we're gonna rewind a little bit um, and, and talk about some of the other communities uh, in Durham, including the uh, newly freed African American population um, and the area of, of Durham that we now know as Haytai. So the actual name of uh, the name Haytai is still somewhat of a mystery. There are some theories, some ideas. Um, some people think it was a term that was used by white people as a name for any black settlement. Others attribute it to black people as an expression of their hope of emulating the independent island nation of Haiti. Um, but the true origin of that of that term is not certain, as far as we know. Um, so maps of other settlements across the South show that the term was used outside of Durham as well. So Haytai in Durham is not the only place that used that name. Um, and the earliest we've seen it on maps is 1867. So the area known as Haytai in Durham got its start in 1866 with the forming of White Rock Baptist Church. So Margaret Fawcett, the woman pictured on the left, um, was looking for a place to worship with her community. They didn't have a church yet. So she began holding services in her home. They organized as a church and called themselves First Baptist. Um, by 1877, 
they had raised money to actually build a church and the first building site was purchased for $75. Um, and after its construction, the church was renamed White Rock Baptist Church for the large white flint rock found in its front yard. And the deed for this transaction from 1877 is the earliest documented use of the name Haiti that we know of. Um, so around the same time, Edian and Molly Markham came to Durham and established another church that would eventually become St. Joseph's AME Church at the intersection of Pettigrew and Fayetteville Streets. Um, so this area was labeled Haiti on an 1881 map of Durham, and that is the earliest use that we know of of the term Haiti on a map. Um, so those two churches were really the bedrocks of the Haiti neighborhood um, and all the businesses and homes that sprung up around them made up that that area of Durham. So back to the the booming tobacco business. Um, Mr. Green died in 1869. Uh, so William T. Blackwell became the owner of, he bought his business, um, Bull, Bull Durham Tobacco. Um, so Blackwell partnered with Julian Shakespeare Carr, um, uh, so a person that we've, we're a little familiar with now, um, who's, who uh, very aggressively wanted to advertise the um, this brand of tobacco. Um, and it was that advertising effort that really put the company on the map. So these are some examples of early Bull Durham tobacco ads. Um, so I'll just give you a, a minute to look at these. Um, that lower left one is quite old. That goes back to about 1877, we think. Um, so these are some examples. And then here are two others. So you'll see they're really leaning into the, the bull um, imagery for their advertising. So in 1869, Durham officially became a city. It um, was incorporated by an act of the North Carolina General Assembly on April 10th um, of that year. And it's important to remind you though that at this point, Durham is still a part of Orange County um, with the county seat being located in Hillsborough. But with all these growing businesses and land transfers and activity going on in the area, the long trip back and forth to Hillsborough became untenable. So about a dozen years later, on April 17, 1881, um, a bill to establish Durham County was ratified by the General Assembly. So the city goes back to 1869 the county to 1881, but the post office goes back to 1853. So that's the earliest date that is commemorated. All right, so we can't talk about Durham without talking about the Duke family. So Washington Duke was the patriarch of what came to be the preeminent tobacco family in the United States. When the Civil War was over, he returned to his farm near Durham, where he began building the tobacco business that would one day make he and his sons, James Buchanan, Benjamin, and Brody famous. Um, sometimes pronounced Brody, I'm actually not sure which is, which is correct, Brody or Brody. I've heard it both ways. Um, so what started as a humble operation out of a single barn became by 1873, a growing business producing over 125,000 pounds of smoking tobacco annually. Um, so you can see in the upper left, that is the original tobacco barn. Um, and then there's an image of Washington Duke and a, an image of the larger Duke Homestead, which is another historic site that you can visit. So by the 1880s, cigarettes were growing in popularity. Um, prior to that, people generally smoked tobacco out of pipes. Um, cigarettes had to be hand rolled and were therefore expensive. Um, so in 1884, James Bonsack, who was um, an inventor from Virginia, he invented and patented a cigarette rolling machine um, called the Bonsack machine. So um, he began a partnership with James Buchanan Duke making full commercial use of the machine, um, which could produce 120,000 cigarettes in 10 hours. Um, so this totally revolutionized the industry and essentially was what led to the Duke family fortune. 
So by 1890, Washington Duke Sons and Company acquired most of its competitors to form the American Tobacco Company, which produced 90% of the cigarettes in the United States that year. Um, American Tobacco Company, however, eventually did break into five smaller companies in 1911 after it was sued for violating antitrust laws. So they just got too big for their own good. Um, so this is an interesting fact, I think, um, about the Duke family. They're actually credited with developing the idea of modern day baseball cards. Um, so in the 1870s, cigarette packages contained a card to stiffen the package um, and make it easier to transport. So by the late 1880s, Brody Duke had come up with the idea to insert Duke branded cards in the packages um, to remind folks who they were buying their cigarettes from. So the cards were printed with many different subjects such as actors and actresses, fishers and fish, jokes, ocean and river steamers, really lots of different um, subjects on these cards. But some of their more religious customers deemed the images of the actresses to be a little too risque for their taste. So pictures of baseball players uh, were used instead. Um, so this developed into what we now know as modern baseball trading cards. So this, um, these cards here are an example of some of those early, uh, they look like baseball cards, but they're there were the cards um, that came in the pack of cigarettes. So in 1884, um, Julian Carr established the Durham Cotton Manufacturing Company. This was the beginning of the textile industry in Durham. Um, and by the early 1900s, there were actually more people working in textile mills than in tobacco factories. So that textiles, tobacco gets a lot of attention in Durham, but textiles actually was um, just as important to the industry in this city. So after an unsuccessful attempt to get Meredith College to move to Durham, Durhamites went all in on Trinity College, which was looking to relocate from Randolph County. Um, so the Dukes offered money for re relocation and an endowment, and Julian Carr donated the land for what is now Duke's East Campus. The college opened in the fall of 1892 and later became Duke University in 1924. Um, so these images here show a very, very early image of East Campus. Some of the buildings, um, especially that observatory, you may still uh, recognize. Um, and then that lower right um, image is some of the early Trinity College faculty. And then this is an image of some Trinity College students um, Dallas Walton Newsom and his brother, Mary and Eugene, were relaxing against the fountain um, that happened to be all that was left of the Washington Duke building and its landscaping after a fire in 1911 destroyed it. Um, so eventually a commemorative statue of Duke was placed on that site. So this is that statue um, commemorating Washington Duke, uh, and you can still see this on East Campus. So uh, this image shows an early plan for uh, Duke's West Campus. The Philadelphia firm of Horace Trumbauer was the architect for um, West Campus. And uh, Duke Chapel was designed by a man named Julian Francis Abel. And he was a lead designer for the Horace Trumbauer um, architecture firm. So Julian Abel was a prominent African-American architect who designed the plans for many of West Campus's buildings. Um, the chapel was constructed and many of the other buildings were constructed primarily by African-American laborers between 1930 and 1935. Um, and to master the collegiate Gothic style, they actually built a practice chapel in 1926 before building the actual chapel on campus. So this image in the lower right here is, is of that practice chapel that they built. Okay, so I'm gonna rewind a little bit again um, to talk about the beginnings of Black Wall Street and how that got started. So in the late 1800s, many black citizens in Durham were denied life insurance policies by white, um, by insurance companies owned by white people due to the perceived risk of selling them policies. 
So John Merrick and Dr. Aaron McDuffie Moore, prominent black businessmen in Durham, founded the North Carolina Mutual Life and Providence Association as an alternative for Durham's black community. A year later, they brought on Moore's nephew, Charles Clinton Spalding, probably more familiarly known as C.C. Spalding, and the business began to grow and become profitable. Um, and this enterprise actually went on to become one of the largest black owned businesses in the entire world. So it was also difficult for African Americans to obtain financing for business centers or homes. Um, John Merrick and Aaron Moore, along with um, some other men, uh, R.B. Fitzgerald, J.A. Dodson, J.R. Hawkins, W.G. Pearson, James E. Shepard, G.W. Stevens and Stanford L. Warren founded Mechanics and Farmers Bank in 1907 with the goal of providing safe banking services to the local Black community. Um, so this image shows some of those founders. Um, Mechanics and Farmers Bank was actually one of the few Black banks nationwide that survived the Great Depression. Many of them folded, um, but Mechanics and Farmers made it through. So in 1901, Aaron Moore founded Lincoln Hospital in the historic Haytai neighborhood. Um, this was in response to the opening of Watts Hospital in 1895, which only served white patients. So um, a man named Dr. Charles DeWitt Watts was the first African-American board certified surgeon in the whole state of North Carolina, and he was the head of surgery at Lincoln Hospital. Um, this hospital provided health care, health education, and medical training for Durham's African-American population until its closure in 1976. So in 1908, James Shepard began working to raise money for a Bible school to train Sunday school teachers and missionaries. He decided on Durham as the location, um, and the school was originally named the National Religious Training School in Chautauqua for the Colored Race. The school opened in July 1910, um, and it became the first publicly funded liberal arts school for African Americans in the country. Um, it underwent a couple name changes over the years. In 1923, it became part of the state system and was renamed the Durham State Normal School for Negroes. In 1925, it was renamed the North Carolina College for Negroes. In 1947, the General Assembly renamed it North Carolina College at Durham. And then finally, it was designated a regional university in 1969 and was renamed to North Carolina Central University as we know it today. So these two images show um, an early class photo from around 1925 of students at the school, um, and then Chidley Hall, which is the oldest dormitory on the campus of North Carolina Central. So the Durham Bulls. Um, in 1912, the Durham Bulls formed as part of the North Carolina State League. Uh, the league ended due to World War I, but the Bulls reformed in 1919. Um, so you can see an early image of the baseball team there. I have to give a shout out to the history of the Durham Library. <laughs> Wouldn't be right without it. Um, so we do have some claims to fame though. The Durham Public Library was actually the first free tax supported library in the whole state of North Carolina. Um, services began in 1897 and Lillian Griggs was the first professional librarian in North Carolina as well. So we have a strong history of library service in, in Durham. Um, we purchased the state's first bookmobile in 1923, and that's an image, um, that's the image that you can see here, children looking at the bookmobile. Um, in 1916, the Durham Colored Library opened as the second library for African Americans in the state. Um, Hattie B. Wooten was its first librarian, um, and it, it originally started in the basement of White Rock Baptist Church before it got its own uh, location. Um, and then in, in 1940, the Stanford L. Warren Library opened, um, and it was named in honor of Dr. Stanford Lee Warren, who donated the money to purchase the land on which the library was built. So the two library systems integrated and merged in 1966 and eventually became what we know today as Durham County Library. 
So Duke Hospital opened its doors in 1930. Um, fewer than five years later, the American Medical Association named Duke School of Medicine among the top 20 medical schools in the country. Um, so this reputation, of course, stuck with the city and eventually became known as the City of Medicine. And this is an image of that um, early Duke Hospital staff from 1931. Um, and there is actually at least one woman that I can see in that photo. Um, so by the 1950s, um, this was a time of great change for Durham's elected leadership. Uh, in, the, in the 1951 Durham local election, history was made when Mary Duke Biddle Trent Siemens, who's Benjamin Duke's granddaughter, became the first woman elected to city council. Um, and then in that same election, Emmanuel J. Um, Mutt was his nickname, Evans, was elected the first Jewish mayor of Durham. And then in 1953, renter Nicholas Harris um, was the first successful black candidate to be elected to city council. So an important person in um, Durham's history is Polly Murray. Um, Polly was a civil and women's rights activist, lawyer, poet, and priest. In 1956, she published the compelling memoir, Proud Shoes, the story of an American family, um, which was the story of her grandparents' struggle in the Jim Crow era in Durham. Um, Murray was actually born in Baltimore, Maryland, but was raised by her aunt, Pauline Fitzgerald, and maternal grandparents, Cornelia and Robert Fitzgerald in Durham. So in 1958, the Research Triangle Foundation um, and Research Triangle Institute were founded with the goal of developing Research Triangle Park. And today, RTP is home to over 170 companies on 7,000 acres of land, about two thirds of which is located in Durham County. Um, and then this area would, would grow and grow and eventually earn um, international renown as the Research Triangle. So in the 1950s, um, Durham's planning director asked students at UNC Chapel Hill's Department of City and Regional Planning to do a study showing how Durham might take advantage of federal urban renewal funds. Um, they responded with a plan for a 200 acre blighted area of Haiti that could be renovated for $600,000. A Durham Redevelopment Commission was created in 1958 and eventually oversaw seven different projects. The stated goals were renewed infrastructure and improved transit options. So the Durham Committee on Negro Affairs um, actually supported this at first. Um, they believed that Black businesses would participate in the real estate transactions and the borrowing and lending that urban renewal would bring about. They also believed that Haiti would benefit from being completely rebuilt. In their eyes, however valuable Haiti was as an expression of Black culture and vitality, parts of it were badly run down and many of its small businesses were struggling. The larger and more prosperous Black businesses had moved downtown by that point. Um, the people who would lose their homes and businesses were assured that they would be fully compensated and that equal or better accommodations would be provided for them. And although uh, many conservatives opposed the bond issue, it did pass by a small majority of about 3%. So unfortunately, the result of urban renewal did not match its promise for a number of reasons related to leadership, local management, and racial bias. Um, some people also felt that um, impoverished Black people in the area had been somewhat hoodwinked by their own middle and upper class leaders. Um, ultimately, in the end, what occurred in Durham should have really been called urban removal. Um, Haiti was destroyed. Durham's leaders did not fulfill their promise to rebuild it. Um, in addition, downtown, the whole area was torn up for nearly 15 years as buildings were raised um, and uh, to make way for the Durham freeway. Um, so in the meantime, more and more shops and stores and businesses moved to shopping centers away from downtown and never came back. So the effects of urban renewal are still very much felt in the community today. Um, and this, this uh, image shows a march protesting urban renewal. All right, so the civil rights era 
Um, Durham has a very rich, strong history of the, the struggle for civil rights. Um, this image shows, of course, Dr. King in the center, um, Reverend Douglas Moore and Reverend Ralph Abernathy are on either side of him um, walking along Main Street in Durham. So one important event that happened in Durham um, was in 1957, six protesters led by the Reverend Douglas Moore entered the Royal Ice Cream Parlor through the colored entrance but they sat down in the white section and they asked to be served. The group was refused and they were asked to leave. When they refused to leave, they were arrested, charged with trespassing and fined $10. Um, so this image depicts them in prayer ahead of their court appearances. So this sit-in, um, it, it didn't get as much attention as the later um, Woolsworth counter sit-in did at Greensboro, but it was very much in the same um, spirit and effort of of taking a stand against segregation. So um, in March 1962, Carolina Theater Management had rejected a proposal from the local NAACP chapter to negotiate its desegregation. They then also refused the city council's request that they reconsider their decision. So as a result, protesters began round robin demonstrator demonstrations in which protesters would line up at the box office and one after another ask to purchase tickets. They were refused, so they went back to the back of the line to repeat the process and they just kept going around and around. Um, a court order ended these demonstrations, so activists took their case to the courts. Um, and it was not until July 1963, following a wave of mass demonstrations and strong efforts by the new mayor, uh, Wentz Grabarek, that Durham's segregated movie theaters would open to all. So despite the 1954 U.S. Supreme Court Brown v. Board of Education ruling um, that school segregation was unconstitutional, Durham public schools were still broadly segregated by 1971. Um, the Durham Federal District Court ordered the schools to comply with desegregation, but many residents still oppose this action. So a charrette or an intense period of design or planning activity um, was called by Councilman Bill Riddick and it became known as the Save Our Schools Charette. So it, it, it consisted of 10 days of town meetings where residents could express their opinions. Um, local civil rights activist Ann Atwater was recruited to co-lead the charrette with C.P. Ellis, who happened to be the exalted grand cyclops of the Durham KKK. Um, so the image on the right shows um, Ann Atwater and C.P. Ellis working behind that desk um, as part of the charrette. So they initially were very skeptical of each other, um, but Atwater and Ellis grew to respect and learn from one another, and they remained friends until Ellis's death in 2005. So together they presented the school board with a list of recommendations from the charrette, and their unlikely partnership brought hope for interracial cooperation to combat poverty in Durham. So these events are depicted in the book, The Best of Enemies, Race and Redemption in the New South by Osha Gray Davidson. And that book was developed into a 2019 feature film starring Taraji P. Henson and Sam Rockwell. Uh, the film, An Unlikely Friendship, is a 2002 award-winning documentary um, that also depicts these events. So for many of us, when we hear civil rights era, we often just think of the 60s, but civil rights, the fight for civil rights never ends. It continues today. Um, so some events in recent memory. Um, on August 14th, 2017, protesters in downtown Durham used rope to pull down the Confederate soldiers monument that stood in front of the old county courthouse. This protest was in response to the Unite the Right rally that had taken place two days earlier, which was a gathering of white supremacists supremacists, alt-right, Klansmen, and neo-Nazis in Charlottesville, Virginia. This event turned violent when alt-right protesters clashed with counter-protesters and culminated in a white supremacist deliberately driving his car into a crowd of counter-protesters, killing a woman named Heather Heyer. Um, so you may remember that um, event, but the image in the upper left shows the Confederate soldiers monument after it was taken down. 
And then in the spring of 2020, amidst the global pandemic, a number of acts of violence against Black people took place across the country. This culminated with the killing of George Floyd and sparked protests throughout the nation and the world. Um, Durham residents participated in protests that remained largely peaceful and many local artists painted murals on boarded up storefronts in downtown. So that is an example of a mural that you can see there. So um, in the late 1940s, Durham began an economic slide downward. Between 1947 and 1959, industrial employment in Durham dropped 19%. Um, and the city declined from second to fourth place among manufacturing cities in the Piedmont. Um, so this trend continued over the next couple of decades with the cotton and tobacco industries leaving town. So the last of the cotton mills closed in 1986, high labor costs, outdated inefficient plants and foreign competition contributed to the nationwide decline of the textile industry. So what had once been the leading source of, of employment in Durham was gone for good. The last cigarette was produced in Durham in the year 2000 when the Liggett and Myers Tobacco Company closed its factory. So then, um, like the rest of the country, Durham experienced many changes in the 60s and 70s. Um, besides the civil rights movement, there was a lot of progress made um, in support of the arts and preservation. Um, the land along the Eno River was made into a state park rather than being dammed up and turned into a reservoir. And the Historic Preservation Society was formed in response to many of the buildings around town that were being raised. Um, so over three days in July 1976, over 100,000 people attended Durham's Folklife Festival as part of the state's bicentennial celebrations. Um, this festival would eventually lead to what we now know as the Festival for the Eno. The North Carolina School of Science and Math opened in 1980 on the grounds of the former Watts Hospital. It's the nation's first state-funded residential high school and focuses on STEM learning. Um, a group that would become the Triangle Lesbian and Gay Alliance coordinated their first annual Pride March in 1986 called Out Today, Out to Stay. And between 600 and 1,000 marchers um, marched through Durham um, with many straight allies joining in, um, solidifying the links between Durham's LGBTQ and progressive communities. Um, Pride Month that year actually began with an LGBTQ related literature display at the Durham County Library, which sparked considerable controversy. Mayor Wibb Gully signed a proclamation declaring the week of Pride Anti-Discrimination Week, leading to a recall effort spearheaded by members of conservative churches who formed an organization known as Durham Citizens for Responsible Leadership. Um, others collected signatures in support of the mayor and the recall petition ultimately failed. So in 1991, the decision to merge the previously separate city and school, uh, city and county school systems was made. Um, this was done largely through the leadership of Bill Bell, who was the chair of the county commissioners. Um, he was also a mayor of Durham for a long time. Um, and the merge system became Durham Public Schools as we know it today. So by 2010, um, the population had continued to diversify um, and Durham actually is the only city in the Triangle region with no ethnic majority. Um, the Hispanic population grew at the fastest rate, more than doubling um, in percentage from the year 2000 to 2020. Um, and this is the, the breakdown of the uh, population as of the 2020 census. So, um, in 2004, there was a Durham Cultural Master Plan and plans for a museum of Durham history were an important part of that. So the museum um, incorporated in 2008 and um, moved to its current location in a revitalized bus station in 2013. Um, efforts to revitalize the downtown area began in earnest in 1993 with the formation of Downtown Durham, Inc. Um, efforts included the new Durham Bulls Athletic Park, which opened in 1995, American Tobacco Campus, um, renovation in 2002, the DPAC opened in 2008, um, and then One City Center, um, now Durham's tallest building, opened in 2018. So additional development of the old 
University Ford dealership site next to American Tobacco Campus is planned. Um, these changes bring prosperity to the city, but not always for everyone. Um, and displacement of longtime residents is an ongoing concern for the future of Durham. So Durham celebrated its 150th birthday on April 10th, 2019. Um, events were held throughout that year to commemorate the occasion, but very sadly, the birthday also coincided with a large gas explosion on North Duke Street that claimed the lives of two people and injured 25 others. So that actually happened on the birthday, the 150th birthday of Durham. Um, and then most recently, Durham made history again this past fall when Elaine O'Neill became the first African-American woman elected as mayor. So I'm just gonna, we're, I know we're almost out of time. Um, we're gonna leave time for questions. I'm gonna give you a couple fun facts about Durham. Um, so the flag, the colors represent royal, uh, the colors, royal blue represents courage, red represents action and progress, gold represents high quality and growth, and the white represents high ideals. The seven stars represent the Taurus constellation, aka the Pleiades, aka the bull, of course, um, and the spirit of Durham. So the seven stars represent the arts, commerce and industry, education, medicine, human relations, sports and recreation, and the preservation of Durham's rich heritage. Um, Durham has a family of sister cities. We currently have nine located throughout the world. Um, and there is a uh, monument to some of those cities. They need to update it um, at Durham Central Park downtown. The movie Bull Durham, um, starring Kevin Costner and Susan Sarandon, was released in 1988. It was filmed on location in Durham and depicted the Durham Bulls minor league baseball team. The house at 911 North Mangum Street still looks much the same today as it did in the movie. So you can drive by and check it out. Um, and lollygaggers everywhere still enjoy this film today. Um, Durham was declared the foodiest town in America by Bon Appetit in 2008. Durham was voted the tastiest town in the South by Southern Living Magazine in 2013. And then just this, this past spring, Chef Ricky Moore of Saltbox Seafood Joint won the James Beard Foundation Award for Best Chef in the Southeast. So Durham continues to have a very rich uh, food culture. Uh, the American Tobacco Trail is a 22.6 mile trail that runs along an abandoned railway route that was originally built for the American Tobacco Company in the 70s. Um, the full trail crosses Durham, Wake, and Chatham counties. So what comes next? Durham has a long and storied history and has seen many changes over the centuries. What will be written in future history books about the Bull City? Um, so I mentioned a couple historic sites that you can visit. Um, historic Stagville, Bennett Place, and the Duke Homestead are all local historic sites that you can visit to learn more. Um, these are some of the books that I use to put this presentation together. Um, you can look at all of these and more in the North Carolina collection at Maine Library. So I will just quickly tell you a little bit about that. Um, we are located on the third floor of Maine Library. Um, we're open six days a week. You can come here to learn anything you want about Durham history. Um, we're running a little short on time, so I won't show you our website, but um, we do have a website. Lots to see about the collection um, and what we can offer. So feel free to contact either my staff at ncc at dconc.gov and there's our phone number or you can contact me directly. Um, there's my email and phone number. So I will turn it over to Raven who will then help me answer some questions. Yes, thank you so much, Lauren. That was an incredible presentation. I feel like I learned so much. I could probably, will probably watch it again. Um, <laughs> don't mind my video being off. Zoom, which is really picky about only having one person with their video on, so that's okay. Um, we do have a couple of questions, and I imagine we might get a couple more, um, so we'll just work through them in the time that we have. Um, so our first question is from an anonymous attendee. It says, Dr. Durham Stone reads, founder of Durham. Did he play a civic or political role in this founding, or um, is this because of donating the land to the train? It really was because of donating the land um, for the train station. Um, the name strictly came from the station that um, 
was formed there. So Dur it was literally called Durham Station. That was the train stop. So eventually a community grew up around the train station and the name stuck. Um, he was elected briefly to the state assembly, um, but he was not a local politician. Um, so he wasn't involved directly with the founding and organization of the city itself. It's more an honorary um, name for him. Great, thank you. Uh, our next question is, what prompted the closure of the Lincoln Hospital? Um, I'm actually not sure off the top of my head. Um, if I had to guess, I would just say probably consolidation around the Duke and UNC um, healthcare systems. Uh, there is actually still a Lincoln Community Health Center, which is, it was formed about five years before the hospital closed. So there was some overlap, but a lot of the same people um, from the hospital wanted to continue that work um, for the more underprivileged members of the community. Um, so that health center does still exist and sort of carries that legacy um, forward to today. Uh, our next question is from Carissa who asks, does um, Mechanic and Farmers Bank have any affiliation with Farmers and Mechanics Savings Bank in Minneapolis, Minnesota? Names and building designs are similar. That is a very good question, and I don't know the answer. Um, I, I know that, um, you know, me Mechanics and Farmers Bank still exists. They're, they have a website um, that talks about their history. I, if I had to guess, I would think they are not affiliated with one another, that it may be a coincidence, um, but I am not entirely sure about that. Um, yeah. All right, our next question is from Elizabeth, who asks, what is the history of Black and Latino coalitions in Durham? Have they ever worked together for an issue? Uh, that is a very good question. And I believe Elizabeth is researching that herself. Um, yeah, there have been some um, organizing groups over, over the years, um, sort of the more progressive caucuses of Durham, um, trying to work together to get more progressive leadership in the city. Um, I wouldn't be able to speak to any specifics on that, um, but I'm sure we have resources in the collection that could help explore those topics further. Yes, I'm going to go ahead and plug again the North Carolina collection. It's great, and the folks there who work there <laughs> are also great. Um, so we have a question from Ann who says, just curious um, if there's any effort to provide reparations for the folks affected by the Haite destruction. Um, so to my knowledge, I don't believe there are any plans for direct reparations, um, but, you know, the, the redevelopment of some of the areas of Haiti is still very much a current issue. Um, there are developers presenting plans to the city and county um, every year, and I know there's a lot of effort to try to include the local community, um, include local leaders to try to make sure that it's as equitable as possible and provides as many opportunities as possible for the people in, in that area um, to help them achieve prosperity as much as you know, hiring people from outside of this area to come and work at new companies. Um, so there are goals to try to, to make those um, development efforts more equitable. So, uh, our next question is, do you know any more history, any more about the history of South Durham, particularly the parts around the neighborhood Parkwood? I know that the Hardin family owns some of the land there. Yeah, so um, of course, you know, there's, there's so much history um, to all of Durham. I'm not, I wasn't able to talk about every um, specific aspect of it. Um, Lee Farm is an area in South Durham that is another, um, it's a state park, um, a, a historic site. Um, so yeah, any of those like specific questions about history of like particular neighborhoods, um, we can definitely help you uh, research that in the North Carolina collection. We have a lot of records from different neighborhood groups, um, including the Parkwood neighborhood. Um, so I would encourage you to reach out to the, the staff at the, at the NCC um, to explore that further. Awesome. Uh, some folks just chime in with saying thank you, a lot of thank yous for a really great presentation. Um, Someone wanted to say that Durham Regional opened as an integrated hospital that closed Watts and Lincoln. Lincoln is a clinic and Watts was the nursing school. 
Okay, that makes sense. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And then we have a question. Any cool facts about the ports in Durham, either historical or current? Hmm. Um, not really off the top of my head. I mean that, um, you know, when the monument ca came down, that was sort of, that's sort of the biggest thing that stands out in recent history. Um, that is the old Durham County Courthouse. There's a new building now. Um, the old courthouse is now an administration building for Durham County. Um, so again, I will just keep plugging the North Carolina collection. All these questions could be explored in much greater detail if you wanna come and learn more. So. Uh -huh. Don't have any more questions. Just want to remind folks, a couple folks are asking, um, this recording will be sent to all registered and waitlisted um, patrons. So uh, you will get to rewatch re all of this amazing information because I know it's a lot. Um, yeah, uh, someone asked, will there be a part two? <laughs> um, no plans as of yet. I think because of the, the interest in this presentation, we'll probably try to offer this on a more regular basis, but I'm sure it will, will organically change and grow um, over the years. Um, but if there are specific topics that you would have liked to see me talk about, I'm always interested and I'd love to hear feedback. So you can definitely um, send me those ideas. Uh, and I'll, I'll definitely keep that in mind for the future. Uh, someone wants to clarify that Lincoln Hospital and the Lincoln School of Nursing were more than a clinic. They were merged into Durham Regional to provide an up-to-date building. Okay, sorry about that. Thank you. All right, um, do folks have any other questions? We have, again, a lot of, a lot of thank yous. Um, I agree with Lauren. Um, hoping to offer this again, because given all the interest that we did have, um, and would love to see folks sort of um, respond with any sort of any topics or anything like that. Um, and we love seeing all the questions. These are really great questions. So thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, thank you so much for attending. This was really exciting for us too to put together. Yeah. So yeah, I'll, I'll just, to, to close, my contact information is there. So if you have any follow-up questions or, or comments, um, feel free to share those with me and feel free to stop by the North Carolina Collection anytime to learn more about all this amazing history we have here in the city. Yeah, if you want, Lauren, you can show the website real fast. Okay, yeah, I, 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 I will. Um, <laughs> let me uh, over here. Can you see that or am I on social? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, hold on. So yeah, for those of you still here and still interested, um, our website can be found um, just from the main durhamcountylibrary.org website. Um, it has information about visiting, um, but you can click this explore our collection um, link to learn about all the different materials that we have. Um, we have a collection of over 5,000 digital um, images um, and they're all online that you can explore. Um, they're organized by collections. So lots and lots and lots of amazing photos to look at um, from, from all sorts of different topics. Um, so we have a book collection of about 18,000 items, but in addition to that, we have over 350 archival collections. Um, so these are collections of papers of local people um, and groups and organizations in Durham. So this um, list here is a list of all the different collections that we have. Um, these are all open and available for research. So. If there's a particular topic that you're interested in, we can help you figure out what collections might have um, material related to that topic. Um, we've put together resources about researching different places in Durham. Um, a lot of people are interested in researching their old houses, the, the history of who might have lived in their home before them. Um, we have files about different people who've lived in Durham over the years. Um, lots of different newspapers, periodicals. Um, we can also help you do genealogy research. So if you're interested in researching your ancestors and, and building your family tree, um, we can assist with that. And then we've curated 
um, a lot of different external resources, um, not just at the North Carolina collection, but um, other websites um, and places where you can learn more about local history. Um, there are a number of different um, online resources um, about Black Wall Street, about the Royal Ice Cream Sit-In, um, different topics, um, links to our uh, fellow heritage sites in the area. Um, the local universities, of course, have lots of archival material about um, Durham history. Um, North Carolina Central has an amazing archive. Um, UNC, they've all got a lot of stuff about local history. And then, of course, the State Library, we're actually fortunate to be not too far away from Raleigh. Um, there's a State Library and a State Archive that has even more information. Um, and then even nationally, um, the Library of Congress and the National Archives have materials about local history. Um, and then in addition to all these resources, we also have a number of digital exhibits on our website um, about a lot of different topics. Um, some of these will even pertain to some of the questions that were asked. For example, this And Justice for All exhibit um, is about um, the, the courts in Durham. So that would be a good place to learn more about that. Bull City Soul, History of Music in Durham. Um, some exhibits about different people, um, the arts, changes in the landscape, how the actual physical buildings and, and skyline has changed in Durham, um, a civil rights exhibit. Uh, this actually we just redid in 2020. Um, so it's gotten, I'll, I'll show this one quickly because um, it's, it's got a lot of information. So if you want to learn more about civil rights history in Durham, um, there are many more events that happened in, in the city than what I covered tonight. So you can um, explore this exhibit. It's, it's organized as a timeline comparing sort of what was going on nationally with what was going on locally. Um, there are a number of featured events of, of specific things that happened in Durham um, that you can learn more about. There's a photo gallery um, of a lot of different um, civil rights related photos. We have, um, I believe, 16 different oral history recordings um, from people who lived in Durham dur during the civil rights era. Um, they were interviewed and recorded their memories of that time. Um, so you can actually listen to those recordings as part of this exhibit. Um, so it's really, really interesting. So I'd encourage you to check that out. Um, and then, yeah, just information about historic schools, more information about tobacco, history of the public library, if you'd like to learn more about that, LGBTQ history. Um, you know, as I said in the beginning, any one of the topics that I presented on could make its own presentation on its own. So um, there's a lot more to explore. Um, so myself and my staff in the North Carolina collection, we're here, that's what we're here for, is to help uh, folks learn about all these different interesting topics. Um, and just learn more about the history of, of Durham and North Carolina. Awesome, thank you, Lauren. Um, we don't have any more uh, questions, just a couple of suggestions for um, future presentations. Someone okay, said it'd be nice great. to hear more about indigenous um, people mm -hmm. past and current, and someone said maybe as a follow-up, we could have someone visit many of these sites that are available and video these sites. So. Mm. Yeah, you know, it's possible that some of those sites, they may have their own virtual programming. Um, mm -hmm. You know, each of those historic sites, Stagville, Duke Homestead, Bennett Place, they all do their own programs. There's different events and things that you can attend. And I would not be surprised if they had some sort of virtual um, tours available, um, but they all have their own designated staff as well. So you could definitely reach out um, and see what might already exist. Yeah. Uh, we did just get a question. Someone asked, are there any notable events that took place during Reconstruction in Durham? Um, I'm sure that 
you know, sort of the what we think of when we think of reconstruction was taking place all throughout the South. Um, there aren't any specific noteworthy events that I'm aware of. Um, that would be something I would have to uh, look into a little bit more uh, to see if there were specific things. Um, the main thing that Durham is known for is that surrender at Bennett Place, um, because that was such a significant event um, in the ending of the Civil War. Oops. That's all the questions we've gotten. Um, so folks can feel free to email Lauren or to stop in to the North Carolina collection with any further questions. Um, but yeah, just thank you again, everyone for participating, for asking questions. Thank you so much to Lauren for all your work putting My together pleasure. the PPP program. Thanks Raven for organizing this and putting this all together. Yeah, definitely. Um, and yeah, we hope to see folks at other Durham County Library programs. Feel free to go to durhamcountylibrary.org to check out other events that we have um, and have a great night. Thanks everybody. Take care.